you from the frozen tundra that is east central alberta canada playing in the background with my music here what a good start to the night let's try that again the east central alberta canada streaming live on youtube facebook float odyssey telegram and twitch welcome back to the workshop where we create community find freedom promote preparedness and share success i am toolman tim and today is july 3rd 2022 and this is episode 136 of the workshop podcast just a minute, we're going to have Miss Lady Lou come on from the Liberty All Day podcast and blog. We're going to have a great conversation about death, dying, and dignity. But real quick, like always, we will get the housekeeping out of the way. So I hope everyone is doing well. Real quick, uh, so this week coming up, Thursday and Saturday are going to end up being pre-recorded shows. Hey, Martins and family, we got you here. I'm going to be on the road picking up my kids and my parents who are flying to Alberta. First time my dad's ever been on a plane. So taking a couple of days off. So they'll be pre-recorded for you. They'll be good content. Number two, join the Telegram group. I say it all the time, but I love that Telegram group. We had a couple new users drop in today, and it's the place to be if you want to interact with the workshop community. So links are in the description. Grab them and go. And Tuesday evening, I will be with some of my fellow fire starters, and we're going to be talking about guns, guns, guns. I didn't say girls, girls, girls. I said guns, guns, guns. And it's going to be fun because a Canadian is going to be hosting a show about guns. So we'll see. I don't really know much about that except butter knives and things like that. So it'll be fun. And finally, uh, today's tool is the Coast Brand 615 Lumen Headlamp. The other day I had to go in and secure a dilapidated hotel. And having a headlamp on my head was an absolute lifesaver, literally and figuratively. So if you're looking for a good one, that is in its pin tonight and of course it's in all the descriptions so we got a great crowd here let's bring on ms letty lou hello ms lou how are you doing all right mr tim how are you great 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 and you're uh you're about six weeks away from some excitement right yep yeah. <laughs> that's all right how, I can't how's wait. the weather been your way um it's been threatening to rain all day crazy humid and it just has not rained, so I'm waiting for it to start so my ankle doesn't kill me much longer. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I I don't know. Uh, we, we don't get a lot of humidity up here, but the times when that rain is just kind of hovering or just after, it's, you get, I don't know, I get weak to it. So I, I, I grew up where it was humid all the time. And now, whenever we can get a little bit, I complain like a, a little schoolgirl, you know, it's <laughs> awful. I don't know. So, we, were, we were able to get some stuff done outside today, though, so that was good. I see you're using, wow, so what did the hubby think of the manual edger? I'd never seen one of those before, actually, so that was kind of cool. Either had I. I had. I never even knew that there was a difference between a weed whacker and an edger until recently. <laughs> and for some reason on my YouTube, I started getting these videos of lawn care guys who would go and take over and just redo, like, overgrown lots and stuff. And they brought this tool out, and I said, I wonder what that thing is. Turns out it's an edger, which is different from a weed whacker, which I always thought, we always use it interchangeably growing up that the weed sure. whacker was the edger. Um, but yeah, the fact that there is actually a manual version of it never knew until my man came home last week with one and he said, Oh, I just picked up an edger. And I said, that's what that thing is. What did he think? He enjoyed it. He had actually used one just like that when he was younger. So when Child he was labor. a kid, he was put to work doing the, uh, the parents lawn with that. Um, and I think little man's going to take it over in the next couple of years. <laughs> I love little man. He's so sweet. Yeah, it, it, it did. It did the, it did the job. It was very labor intensive. Uh, we did find out that if you kind of like weed whack first, especially if it's really overgrown onto the sidewalk, it helps break up the dirt. So you're able to get oh. in there better and really clear it out. So. Well, that's cool. Yeah. I, I have an edger for my weed whipper, so it's a special blade that's powered. Yep. But before that, all I ever used is, do you know those step-on edgers or they're like a sod cutter? Yeah. That's all I'd ever seen before. And when I saw this, I was like, huh, that's kind of cool. Just yeah. rolls right on along. So, yeah, I think this is the first time you've been on the show, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to have you. So, <laughs> and most everybody knows you, but we always do the same thing. We get, get you to tell us a little bit about yourself. And something I love to ask everybody is, what was your first job in high school? or junior high or whatever. Where'd you start? And then tell us where you went from there. 
Okay, let's see. My first job, ooh, I was 12 and my aunt hired me to come work for her at her vocational rehabilitation firm. She just, I went to work with her on take your kids to work day because I didn't want to go to school where my mother taught. <laughs> <laughs> and um, she just put me to work filing things, organizing. And the first thing I said to her was, why do you use two separate time cards over two weeks when you can just flip it over and have your employees punch it? And she's like, you just saved me all of this money in buying time cards now. So I, I worked for her. We, we would usually go to trade fairs and seminars and stuff like that. So she taught me how to mingle with business folk and how to talk to doctors and other nurses and medical people. So went from there and then just got into babysitting, lifeguarding, what else have I done along the way? I was a loss prevention detective for six years. Can you share? I, I always love, I had Donald on a while ago. I don't know why yep. I'm intrigued by loss prevention, but <laughs> you, get, you got a story or two that uh, just lights the old fires from that. You must've found something interesting. In that. Um, Let's see. So what I like doing the best was the employee thefts and the organized crime groups that would hit the stores. Okay. So the one store that I worked at, we were actually in a mall and because nobody listens to loss prevention, and they decided this was back in like 06 to 08. So apple bottom jeans and all that stuff were really big and they were really big in the uh, shoplifting community. Sure. So where do we put them right inside the door, like less than like 20 feet in it, and people would, they come in with garbage bags and just swipe into the garbage bag and then run out the door. So I saw this one chick walk in at the other end of the store. And I, I go to my boss on the radio. I said, I need you in the office. <laughs> Boots with the fur. That's right. They said, and I need you on the camera so I can get down there and watch this chick. Because she's been in here four times this week. And I have not gotten her yet. And I'm going to get her today. <laughs> and he's like, okay, Letty, let's do this. So he's upstairs on the cameras and I'm down there and I'm laying on the floor under a fixture on the other side of the doorway, <laughs> like curled up out of there. So nobody can actually see me. And I watch this girl come in. She goes behind the table, pulls out a, her garbage bag and she just looks up. There's no one coming. Boom. Puts it all in. Takes the other garbage bag, puts it on top. Oh my God. <laughs> And I'm sitting there and this is before smartphones, so I can't be recording it or anything. So I'm just so I'm just like whispering into my my microphone to my boss. This is what she's doing. And he's writing it down with the time because he doesn't have it on camera. And the girl, she kicks the bag under the table that the jeans had been on, gets up and walks around the department. And I said, OK, I said she's getting ready to leave. So I said, you follow, I said, get her on the camera. And as soon as she walks out the door, come down because I know she's going to be fighting me over this one. <laughs> so at this point, like she goes and she gets the bag, she puts it in a shopping cart. I was like, okay, well now I know where it is. <laughs> and I get up and I'm just pretending to shop. You know, I got my, I had to learn how to carry a purse for the first time. Cause I, I'm not a purse person. So I was like, what do you even do with this? And um, she goes to the door, picks this, these garbage bags up <laughs> out of the, uh, the shopping cart and I just walk up to her and I pull up my badge is like lost prevention you need to come in with me and she's like f you <laughs> and, <laughs> and takes off running so, and so I'm just like we got a runner and I knew my boss was coming around the other way so I go out there and she throws the bag at my feet I jump up over it and I ended up tripping and like flipping over like so I end up with soft tissue damage all in my arm and my boss comes in like, she's going to Kohl's, go get her. So he, he takes off running even faster. And he had to tackle her to bring her back in. Oh, man. And it was about $3,500 worth of apple bottom jeans that this chick had, had stolen from the store. But she we ended got up her. going to jail, or at least somewhat. <laughs> Who knows? So that one, they we sent her to the, the police department. I had court with her like three or four weeks later. And I was watching this um, public defender who was just ripping apart police officers all day until they called my case. And I was like, oh, God, I'm going to end up with this freaking public defender and she's going to try to rip a hole in my case. So I'm sitting there reviewing my case notes and everything. And I 
it's it's my turn. I walk up and the state's attorney says, okay, just let Johnny Cochran do his job. And I start laughing. And he's like, you know who Johnny Cochran is? It, and I said, I said, yeah, like I, I watched the OJ trials. I know who Johnny Cochran is, you know? And he's like, okay, so we'll be good. Have you ever testified before? I'm like, nope. <laughs> and he's like, oh shit. He said, it'll be, it'll be fine, dude. So I get up there and of course it's that public defender and she starts asking me questions. Well, exactly how many feet away were you from my client when you were watching her take the jeans off the rack? <laughs> and I'd actually gone out there before to <laughs> Okay, it, Brian, I was like I was Paul like Blart. Paul Blart. I was I was the female Paul Blart, okay? <laughs> and she's she just starts asking me question after question and she's like question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. And the girl the whole time like she had this big old smile, like I'm getting away with this. And as I keep answering the questions and just counting everything, she, you could just see her just start to, oh no, I'm in trouble. <laughs> but yeah, so she ended up, I think she got six months and then public service, community service for that one. But well, you did your job that, and then, so you ended up from there. So, okay. You went from law <laughs> prevention. You ended up working in a law office in Chicago. Yeah, I worked in-house counsel for a financial services for a, a clearing firm, actually, with the, the stock market. And just for the record, what do you do now? Now I stay at home with my four-year-old and we'll have <laughs> we'll have the other one in six weeks or so. So so how did that, how did, yeah, <laughs> share the Cliff Notes version of <laughs> how that all came about. It's really cool. I enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I left loss prevention. I got sick and tired. They wanted me to to focus on regular shoplifters. I'd rather focus on internal employees and organized crime units. So I left, couldn't find a job for six months. So I said, well, I'm gonna go back to school. I went to school to become a paralegal. And um, that took two years. I started babysitting in my off time, got a job at Allstate doing contract management. And right before I graduated, I found this job opening for a clearing firm. And I knew I didn't want to do family law. I didn't want to do real estate. I didn't want to be holding people's hands doing criminal, criminal law. <laughs> so I said, well, I want to do contract or corporate. And this came about. They took a chance and I worked with them for five years. Um, I ended up doing a lot of assisting to the uh, CEO, teaching him about running meetings and Robert's Rules of Order and <laughs> then... Uh, oh, I don't miss that class. Yeah. And, then I, and then after four years, I had... Little man, I went back to work two days a week and it was downtown Chicago and I was gone for 12 hours a day and it was just too much. So my husband got a new job, so I quit mine. We moved out to Dubuque. That job and housing stuff didn't work out. So then we moved up here to Northwest Wisconsin and he's been with his job for about three years now and we just bought our house last fall. So. Yeah, that's. <laughs> Were you guys always the homesteady type, or not really? Probably it. No, no, we were we were a straight up suburban Chicago kids, you know. <laughs> in, in in the uh, that that's a gun free zone, right? Where you worked in Chicago. Yeah. Luckily, I mean, my building did not have um, metal detectors. Okay. Oh, Most so of them did. It was so gun was, free. Yes, yeah, so if I was ever going to a like a meeting somewhere that I didn't know where it was, I would have to empty out my bag because I always have at least one knife on me or within mm -hmm. arm's distance. And I would have, I had, I had a, I had a buck knife, a regular pocket knife. Um, <laughs> another little knife that I found that also had um, the fire starters on it. I had a map with ways to get out of the city. Like, cause I realized if something happens, I'm screwed. <laughs> That's I've got, awesome. I've got 35 miles to get back home. What am I going to do? It's like a going home book, right? Pretty much. Pretty close. Yeah. But you, but you decided just to move to the, the country and you haven't really looked back. Hey. Yeah. I mean, we, we ended up, we got married out near Galena, which is near Dubuque, um, but on the Illinois side of things. And it was just always a place that made us happy and we were calm and, hmm. As we'd be leaving the suburbs, we could just feel the weight off of our shoulders just go away. So we said, this is where we want to be, what we want to do. And now we live we live in town now. We're in a very small town. But 
in the next three to five years, we plan on getting some land and nice. starting some animals and really, really going into the homestead and homestead style side of things. It was a big jump, but you guys did it and you're doing it. So yep. proud of you. <laughs> Cause it didn't, it was, it, you had rough, you had some rough bumps to yeah. make your way over there. Didn't you? Oh yeah. Yeah. But you're, you're doing it now, aren't you? I'm proud. Absolutely. <laughs> so we, um, I, you and I have talked about this topic a little bit before. Yep. And we actually, we did a show, didn't we? Yes, we did. We did a, a Fireside Freedom show. And because, I don't know, I, I, I find of all the topics in preparedness, death seems to be one of the ones. See, I even have to almost whisper it a little bit when I say it. But it seems Say it loud like, and say it proud, Tim. Right, death, you know, <laughs> death, dying, and dignity. I, it, it. So why, why is that important to you? Why did you want to come on here and talk about death? Um, number one, because it seems to be so taboo among, among most people. Sure. Not nobody, just forever. You're right. No, yeah. Nobody ever wants to talk about it. They get all uncomfortable. They get uptight. Nobody wants to think about themselves or their children or their family and friends dying. Um, I'm a hundred percent Irish. I grew up, we had a funeral at least once or twice a month <laughs> growing up. So for me, I grew up and it was just very common to say, Oh, so-and-so's dying. We're going to, we'll have another funeral coming up or in the next couple weeks or the next month or so, you know, so just, just be prepared. Um, and it was, it was never something we didn't talk about. Sure. But as I grew older, I realized, Oh, nobody else goes to the cemetery like every other Sunday to uh, have a picnic and clean up the graves of all the family and visit all of the dead family members that are there. That's, Something my family does, but nobody else. Was, so that, I, was that the Irish or was that just your family? I, I think it's it's a very Irish thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. but I I definitely know it was it was very much ingrained in my family to do so to do it as well. And did you guys do the whole Irish wake where the body was actually at the house and or no? Not here in the States, but we've had several family members in Ireland have those. Okay. Good. When I was a kid, I mean, this is anyway, up until a couple of years ago, the last person who was close to me who died was my grandfather in like 87. So it had been a long time until we lost a couple of aunt or an aunt and a cousin. But so we, they had a, a, the first day was that kind of in the house visitation kind of, it wasn't maybe as joyous as an Irish wake, but I always remember it. It was neat yeah. to have him there in the piano room and, you know, we all, yeah, you know, so but yeah, so why should it be a normal thing or a positive thing? Or yeah, what do you think? Because it is, it's a, it's a topic that we just, I don't know. That's half the reason I wanted to bring you on again is because <laughs> I it's it's something I want to become more comfortable with because I kind of suck about talking about it. <laughs> well, it happens. That's it. What do they say? There's two th two po two two things in life that always happen: death and taxes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know. The one thing that you and I have in common, like besides the other things, we're going to die one day. Yep. You know, and th there's no, there's no, dif there's no going around it, you know? So it, you have to be comfortable with that knowledge and preparing yourself. And I have to be, do the same, but we also have to realize that it's not just us, our family, our friends, so, random celebrities that you may really enjoy, they're going to die. <laughs> Sure. And it could be sudden. It could be someone's got cancer and you don't, you know, they're given six months to a year. So you have that time. It could just be old age. You never know what it's going to be, but it happens. And this is going to sound really just rude, but people need to get over it. <laughs> You're not wrong. I agree with you for sure. It's not rude. It. So do you think, I don't know, it's, it's tough because we grow up and I forget the stats, but I mean, when, when we're kids and we, it was TV, now it's the internet, but how many fake deaths or deaths we see, you know, violence. I, mean, I love mm -hmm. horror movies. I'm, you know, oh, the yeah. warrior that the kills the better, but at the same time, we have all of this association with death in the world and, and media, but then the actual real idea of death, we almost run away from. Yeah. Does that, do you find that too? Oh, absolutely. And I think it's because it's so far removed. No, people tend to not die at home. 
Okay. They they die in a hospice center. They die in the hospital. Um, you you don't get a lot of the the home deaths, and you, most people don't do the wakes at home anymore. They think it's illegal to do so. <laughs> it's actually not. <laughs> really, I didn't yeah. know that. Is that a, really? Can you elaborate a little? Um, I mean, you, there are certain restrictions for your different states and everything, but you can very much have that home wake. Um, the other thing that goes along with that is you do not have to inject your dead bodies with formaldehyde. They do not have to be embalmed okay. at all. So that's all, that's one of the ways that the, the, the funeral homes make their money is by the embalming <laughs> so and doing okay. the big wakes and buying the casket, especially if you buy the casket, but then you're still going to have the person cremated. It's like, no, you don't have to do that. You can actually rent the casket if you're doing the wake your body then gets put into a cardboard box. It's slid in. And then when your wake is over, the body is slid on out and they incinerate it and you get your cremains. <laughs> Makes sense. I mean, saves I a lot of money. <laughs> so I have a, I have a good customer and a friend who is a, uh, a content creator in, in the death field. Ooh. So he's uh, he, he, he runs a funeral home, but he also does a lot about, people dealing with grief and that sort of thing. So nice. I really respect him. And this isn't a reflection on him or any one other person, but the funeral industry kind of bugs me just a little bit. Do you, I Maybe it's the cheap guy in me, but, and up until recently, it always seemed, you know, the whole idea was the grieving family went to the funeral home and they were talked into buying the $6,000 pearl lined. It, do you, you know what I'm getting at there? Yeah, and like I said, if you're cremating and you buy the casket, that six thousand dollar casket you just bought also gets cremated. Right. So, and then even if you're burying them, it goes into the ground. Nine times out of ten, you've been injected with formaldehyde and all the other things. You're put into a cement box that is then sealed because you have all these toxins and poisons inside the body. They don't want them leaching out really? into the ground. So it's like you spend all this money and you're you're burying it, but so many people now they die with debt that it's you could have taken that six grand and used it to whatever debts may may be left that don't get forgiven when somebody dies. Well, I don't you know? know about you, but I, I don't like the idea of leaving or creating a great big bill for my family. If they're the ones having to deal with, nope. you know, my, my dead ass at that time, right? Yeah, well, and the other thing is, too, is a lot of people don't realize you can actually go ahead and pre, if you want, if you want the full funeral and wake and everything, you can pre-plan and pre-pay for it. So you can lock Ooh. in the prices. Like if you got cancer and you know that you got a year, less than a year, you can go to the funeral home and say, these are my wishes. This is what I want to have done and lock it in. So you're paying right then and there. And a lot of people also don't realize the cheapest way, if you're going with the funeral home, direct cremation. So, right. Tim, say you just keel over right now in the middle of our chat. <laughs> Knock on wood, not that that's going to happen. Okay. Becky would be to, would come in. I'd be like, Becky, direct cremation. Just send him to the funeral home, get him cremated, and have him come back. You'll usually have the cremains within a day or two. It Put is in a coffee can. Yeah, it's it's the the fastest and easiest way, and then you can do whatever you want with those cremains. Whether you just put them on the mantle, or they get thrown in a closet somewhere for however many years, and all that stuff. We can um, bury them, want, throw throw them out. Do you want me to bring up questions as we go, or do you? Yeah. Want me, okay. So Squishy says, "Isn't it like three k or three grand to get cremated?" I'm all I, I want to be cremated. So you know, because I didn't think. It it, de yeah. it depends on where you're at. Okay. Um, that is something you want to shop around. But the most that I've ever seen direct cremation for with without the wake or anything is three to five thousand dollars. Oh um, wow! Even if, that's expensive, isn't it? I, I have a solution and a way around it, though. Okay. <laughs> don't don't say. Oh, anyway, I won't say. That's a bad joke. Go no, ahead. we're not going Viking funeral. It's not going to okay. be Viking funeral. Not going to be a bonfire in the backyard. Not a mass cremation of a bunch of people in one. No. Okay. No. Go ahead. No. 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 Um, what you can do is so you donate your body to science. Mm. Um, you know, you can go ahead and donate organs, all that stuff. 
both my uncle and my grandmother donated their bodies and they were sent away. They did whatever they did with them. Um, organs were removed, different, like my uncle's brain because he had survived a stroke 35 okay. years earlier. They took his brain for studying and everything. You don't really, you don't, from my understanding of it, you didn't, we didn't pay for anything. They, the company took it. They did with the bodies, what they were going to do. Then they cremated it and sent the remains back to us. How long did that take? Do you remember? <sighs> Grandma's didn't take very long. Grandma's was within two weeks. Okay. And Uncle Junie was within a couple months. <laughs> that's kind of cool. I never thought we'd chat about how to save money on a funeral, but that's oh, great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I, I don't know. I don't know if you've looked, but I'm sure the average funeral's got to be over 10 grand at this point. People have to take out loans. There's payment plans you can do at the funeral home. And again, it like that's their that's how they make their money is <laughs> we always see there's always one smart ass in the group so brian says for some reason he's thinking about barbecue but i'm not really sure why but i yeah. mean if you got a big enough grill but i but you can't here's the thing you can't always get them hot enough to actually do a cremation so like the whole viking burial thing where you put them out on the lake and fire them it never gets hot enough to actually cremate the remains they're just pushing it off in the water and letting nature deal with it later. Basically. On. <laughs> so Mauser says there's a book put out by Eastern Orthodox Ooh. Church titled A Christian End, which details the legalities, the process and preparing of the body and the theology of all of it, if that part Ooh. interests you. So I thought I'd read that out. Yeah. On the audio. To, I'm going to have to check that out and add it to my list of uh, to my little death focused library. <laughs> And Mauser also says that he has several friends who make or have made simple pine boxes for people. Yep. And we've, I know I, I, we didn't come on to talk about our favorite book, the, the going home <laughs> series. However, Mad did that exact thing. Yes, he did. So this might be a good time. How about we, uh, we, we're going to jump around a little bit. That's fine. Since, since we're talking about it, what about, okay. Like uh, an SHTF, a shit hits the fan kind of situation. And the whole idea of, the funeral process being uh, cathartic, you know, like mm -hmm. being away. What you want to elaborate or chat a little about that? Yeah. So if the world were to end, we lose, there's an EMP, whatever happens, you know, and the funeral home business is just gone. Or <laughs> so many people were dying that they were overwhelmed and all of that sure. stuff. They've um, saved the last two years. Anyway, you know, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, keep going. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the biggest issue with having dead bodies around is disease spreading <laughs> sure, <laughs> because yeah, yeah. they're going to attract bugs. They're going to attract the flies and the mice and the rats and everything. That's not something anybody wants to walk in on. It's not something that I want to think about happening to my loved ones were they to die. So if something were to happen, I'd be like, okay, pulling out a sheet. We'll wash the body up. Wrap you in the sheet, and we are going to find a way to dig a hole in the backyard. <laughs> if you're on a farm, most farms have tractors with digger attachments and all that stuff. So you can make that happen. But if you're like me, you're just going to be out in the backyard with a, uh, a shovel digging. <laughs> I would much rather bury my family members like that and leave a marker so I have somewhere that I know that they're at. The other alternative would be to burn the bodies. Sure. And I burning bodies is a lot easier if you have multiples. <laughs> I get it. Or using an accelerant. And okay, yeah. and we're not talking about <laughs> cremation. We're just kind no. of talking about doing a how to dispose of a body. Exactly. The parts that are diseased. Yeah, yeah. I get yeah. it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So in the one thing that in the going home series that we've talked about too is they actually take the they take the bodies of their family and friends that die and they go out and nine times of the time they're hand digging yeah. because that's their way of grieving you know they're they're like this person was important to me i'm going to go out there and we're going to bury them in the ground in a spot that they they enjoyed or that means something to them or when i see it it reminds me of them right and the bad guys in that book <laughs> they usually they're buzzard food yeah, they'll yeah. they'll they'll usually just pile them up and then burn them because it's easier. But you know, you think about it, like the way that it was traditionally done, 
if you went out, I don't know. I can't remember. Well, there was a guy who used to come to my hardware store, he used to hand dig graves. I want to say that with two of them, it was somewhere around four to six hours to dig, mm -hmm. I think. And he, he was an expert at it. Yeah. So you, you think you've got, and there's something, there's something that brings a bit of release with a lot of physical labor, right? Absolutely. So you've got four to six hours of digging where all you're doing is thinking about who you lost and you're exerting a ton of energy and you know, you, you got that full time to really, to, to do nothing else, but think about it, you know, mm -hmm. and in process, I'm not saying it would, it, it's not going to get rid of it, but I think it would be a huge step toward dealing with it. And something that I never thought of, I, this is going to sound really dumb, but I was thinking this the other day, they always talk about digging the hole, but God damn it. You got to fill the hole in too, when you're done. <laughs> And that's actually one of the one of the things too that, like with all the funerals that I've been to, most of my family gets cremated, so we don't usually have the big giant. Yeah, it, it is humbling. We don't we don't have the casket to fill, but what we usually do is. So if you die, if someone were to die today, we would have the memorial in a month or so, because in that way, because everybody the time to organize to fly out and get to whatever and all of that stuff, but we'll take flowers and a, a rose or whatever their favorite flower was. And everyone's going to drop one into the grave on top of the, the cremains. Sure. And then usually one or two people will stay behind and put a couple shovels in of soil over it while the cemetery people do the rest because cemetery people can be very particular mm -hmm. <laughs> about the way that it gets done. So see that you you would have to if if you wanted to fill it yourself and you were going to a cemetery, you would want to make sure that you're working with the people there to do it the way that they want to. So you're not really getting in trouble. They are quite accommodating though. So I think we got the right person on this show tonight. You you know a little bit about everything, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> so to, yeah, you're you're talking about how you guys put your roses and different things. Tradition, and I don't know, I'm, I haven't even really looked at the questions we had yet, but anyway, <laughs> the whole tradition mindset, whether you're religious or non-religious, mm -hmm. I think tradition plays a bit, excuse me, a big part in that too, hey? <clears throat> Absolutely. Do you, uh, do you think that's part of the grieving process? I mean, you, you can speak, obviously, from your Irish roots, at least. I think so. I, um, I you know, traditions are... I think traditions are a really important way to not only honor the memory of your family and friends who have passed, but as a way to work through your grief. Um, like you said, it takes four to six hours to dig that hole for a body. That's a great way to, to think about, like go through the memories and work your way through those five stages of grief. So if there's that book by um, Kubler, I think is her name, the five stages of grief. And, Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Sure. It's like, like I know this. Um, it's a great way to be able to work through it, you know. And when you're angry, like there's nothing better to do than something physical, especially like digging into that ground, getting that dirt up, and throwing it around, you know. So, so you use that, and then with your traditions, it's it's another way to actually help you with the final closure, that acceptance that this person who meant something to you is gone. Especially if it's somebody who passed suddenly. I lost a cousin at the end of March. Hmm. Um, my aunt came home and found his body. He had been dead for 10 days. Oh, wow. Um, complications from diabetes that he, he wasn't taking care of himself. Sure. And he was a couple days away from turning 40, you know? So I was like, man, I'm closing in on 40. You know, it, so it really hit me and um, we had a joint memorial for him and another aunt of mine who passed away in January. We had that at the end of March or beginning of June. Okay. Not March. Oh my goodness. Pregnancy okay. brain, I tell you. Um, and it was one of those things, you know, my cousin had had about five months to deal with the loss of her mother and handling all that and, her brother and sister and their families too. And then my aunt and uncle and my cousins who lost their brother, they had about two months to um, to kind of go through it. 
and as we we got to we got to the week of the the memorial my aunt was talking to my mother and she said yeah i i can't do the eulogy my husband can't do it the girl the girls they're just finally starting to accept that they lost their brother they're finally getting over their anger towards him so can you find someone else to do it and my mother was going to volunteer but she was already doing my aunts and i said i'll take care of it don't worry i had never done a eulogy before so i was like oh my god how am i going to do this like what what do you put into a eulogy right i had done a reading at my uncle's funeral back in 03 you know he was a he was a retired priest so i actually requested when i was helping grandma plan history i said we need to put this one reading in there because he always quoted it and at every mass that he said he made sure that that was one of the readings so i did that and i remember breaking down crying 20 years ago reading this so and i'm sitting i was like oh man what am i going to do with my cousin so my husband actually he found a really great quote about music and life because my cousin was a musician and he said, well, let, let's focus on the music side of things. I said, okay. And then I sat there and I wrote something up and I showed it to my mother and she said, well, you need to mention this and this and this and this and this. And I looked at her, I said, it's not an obituary. Right. I said, I'm, I said, huh. half the people that are going to be there don't even know who he is because we were doing the joint for my aunt and him. So then I brought it over to my other aunt who was there and she looked it over and said, well, let, let's move a couple things around in here. And the day of, I get up there and I was like, okay, it's my turn. <laughs> and I've got a fear of public speaking. <laughs> so I was like, okay. And my husband said, if you need me to, he's like, I never met the guy, but I can get up there and, and I'll do it for you. And I said, okay. So if, so I said, if I need you, I'll, I'll call you up. I did it. It's one of the hardest damn things I've ever done in my life. Wow. Um, because I was remembering all the time, all the fun that we had when we were kids, when they would, he would come visit and, and all that stuff. And then I have his, his two sisters there who have been upset with him for, for many years. And you can see them just the relief that they didn't have to get up and speak. But also as I was calling out some of the things that, all three of us had done, or all four of us had done when we were kids, you could see that they were actually en enjoying it. And they were like, somebody gets it. So for me, that actually helped me grieve too, because I was upset. I was pissed off with him when he died because I'm like, jerk, you could have, you could have taken care of yourself and this wouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. But that actually helped me get through that very final phase. Like I had accepted the fact that he was dead, but at that point, I was like, this is me saying goodbye to you, Ian. You know, I'll see you again at some point. And until then, take care. But we're going to remember you. So, and oh. <laughs> so what did you, you focused on? I mean, I kind of like that quote about it's not the obituary because it is. Yeah. So what did you do? Just kind of tell a story? or I did. So th this his three focuses in life were his family, music, Sorry, baby's moving. Oh, and um, he volunteered for, he had worked for and then ended up volunteering for this homeless shelter hmm. that he had found out about when he was in college. So I focused on the family at first and talked about how they moved around because my aunt was in the Air Force and, but they would always come back. And I kept tying it back into, this is, they always went back to their, their lake cabin. And then I tied in him and his nieces to my cousin continuing that that on we're going to the lake cabin every summer and then we went on through the music because we would put on shows whenever he would come visit <laughs> we'd make up songs we just sing songs and all that stuff in grandma's basement but you know it it just it told we i told a story and picked out the most important parts you know sure and to me when i've been to funerals those are the eulogies that make me cry like a freaking baby. <laughs> yep, I get it. I mean, I cry at every funeral that I go to, whether or not I've even met the person. I had a cousin who died almost 20 years ago. I don't ever remember meeting this cousin, but I'm at the graveside as they're putting him in. And my one uncle walks up and he's like, Luddy, when's the last time you saw him? And I said, I've never even met the guy. 
<laughs> so I'm sitting Aww. there crying. But you know, it it's one of those things. We talk about going to a good funeral. Was, was it a good funeral yeah. that you were at? Yep. And for me, a good funeral is one that tells me about that person in their life. And then when you're getting together afterwards, when you're, you know, you go to the bar, get a drink and you're sitting around eating and chit chatting and everyone just talks about it. And you're sharing the, the eulogy is the start of the story sharing hmm. because everyone has a story. And if you're not sharing that story right there and you don't continue it, there's how likely is their story to keep on getting repeated by those who know them? Well, they, you know, the old adage says, uh, each human dies twice. You die once your physical death. Yeah. And the, the second time is when the last person that knew you or tells your story dies. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. I like that. That's really good. <laughs> we, had, my little guy's actually been a big fan of the movie Coco lately. Yeah. And it kind of goes through that, you know, the one character he keeps starting in the afterlife, he starts to like fade away and he goes, my daughter is forgetting me and she's the last right. person to remember me. And I'll, and I'm, and I'm watching this like, man, this is such a deep thing for these little kids to be learning. But I was like, it's so good because so many parents don't talk to their kids about it. They don't take them to funerals and wakes or anything. They just leave them aside. Cause they don't want to, they don't want to ruin their childhood and introduce them to that. Hmm. Cabot says, what about your mental death? I'm, I'm wondering, might be able to get him to elaborate a little more on yeah, that. Yeah. I just, I don't want to, I don't want to pre presuppose what he's, you know, but so, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how about death planning? Like, you, because I, you did, this was something you did send to me was about a death plan more yeah. than, because hopefully most people have life insurance and maybe a will. So what's the difference and, and why are all those things important? Okay, so make sure you got life insurance and your will and estate planning all done. Get that shit done, people, and get it done properly because there's nothing worse than dealing with probate and having to go through the courts to get everything taken care of, especially if you don't have power of attorney taken care of correctly and nobody has access to your bank accounts and they need that money to pay off any debts that your estate may have or to pay for your funeral. <laughs> Um, take care of those legalities. Make sure that, that with the life insurance, you have money available for your family and children, especially if they're younger. Um, but the death plan is actually something for you and your family. And mm -hmm. it's something you guys should all sit down and discuss. Oh, yeah. There we are. You can keep going. Well, Ooh, sorry, okay. I cut you off. I'm sorry. Keep going. You're okay, talking yeah. about the death plan. Yep. Um, so... A couple of years ago, I actually created a Google, a Google sheet doc that I've shared with my family members. And the first page is all references, um, Illinois law, Wisconsin law, because they're all in Illinois. We're up here in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think what else I have on there. I'm actually pulling it up this week to update it because I've got the C-section happening next month. So I don't expect any issues, but. Just I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure it's up to date for me, and I'm also gonna create a page on there for Bug. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yep. Um. But yeah, so the first page is pretty much all different references. Um. If there's local funeral homes and cemeteries that you guys are used to using, I've got I've got space for that. Um, because we're Catholic, we always we tend to do the Catholic mass, the memorial mass, mm -hmm. links to information and planning those masses. And then the next page, the next tab on there is actually full of, it'll be a contact list for you specifically to put in. So insurance companies, um, employers, financial assets, all of that stuff. Anybody that needs to be contacted. And then especially for once somebody dies, how do you go about telling the family that somebody's dead? So I have on there, just a note, put one person who can contact each of the main branches of the family to make sure that nobody's nobody's missed that they all get the news and that it actually goes into a page for each person in that family. So it's, do you want to die at home? Do you want to die at the hospital? Oh. Do you want to be cremated? Do you want to be buried whole? <laughs> for me, I would much rather be wrapped in a shroud and buried under a tree. Okay. But 
the place that I found, I actually, it's brand new. It's a conservancy burial ground and it's run by the conservation foundation. Okay. So it's, you have, you can only be buried there like full body burial within 24 hours of death. So I'm like, Oh, if I were to die in Wisconsin, I don't know if they'd be able to get the body down there, that fast. but they still do cre cremains and you can spread them or you can bury them. Okay. But I've, so it's, where do you want to be buried? Do you want a mass? Do you want a memorial? Do you want nothing? That's fine. But just making sure that everybody's wishes are known. And then it's also, who's the executor of your will? Who's the attorney to contact for that stuff? And, um, and then because we do, we usually do the Catholic Memorial Mass, what readings do you want and who do you want to read them? What songs do you want? Who do you want to do the eulogy? <laughs> I mean, we get it all in there. So that way, when somebody dies, we, we know what everybody's individual wishes are. I've also got on there, who has your medical power of attorney? So right. if you're in the hospital, do you have a DNR and do you need somebody to actually pull the plug for you? Right. So that leads to <laughs> Cabot's question. So yeah. I'm glad I got him to clarify because yeah. I wasn't quite heading in that direction when I first read it. So I'm going to read them out here for the audience, for the audience yep. too. But so Cabot asked, what about mental death? And then I got him to clarify. He said, if someone becomes for lack of a better term, a veggie mental death, then physical death. And then the third follow-up was maybe not the intent here, but when is it good to end a life that has no hope? A mind trapped in a body that can't communicate if the mind even functions anymore. So there's a lot to unpack there, lady. But yeah, there, I, yeah, there was a big case. Um, oh God, probably about 15 Ter years ago. Terry, Sh Terry, Terry Shivo. Yep. Don't know how I pulled that out of my head, but anyway, go. <laughs> and I'm sure I'm like, I was like, I was like digging through. I was like, I know as I start talking through this, I'll get the name. And there was a legal battle for years between her husband and her parents over what to do with her body. Because she was a vegetable. Right. Um, and I mean, I kept I kept looking at that one and all I could think was, that's not a, what I want for me. I want, like, I'm making sure everybody knows if that happens to me, I do not want to be kept on life support. Because there was very, there was a very, very, very little chance that she could come back from it. Right. And she didn't. Yeah. Yeah, and her husband kept saying, no, she doesn't want this. She she would she would not want this. But her parents were fighting to keep her on, on the support. If, if I remember this correctly, and I'm pretty no, sure. That, what it was. I, that's exactly how I remember it as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so for something like that, I mean, in my family, we all have DNRs. We do not resuscitate. We do not want to be kept on life support machines or anything like that. And we all know this. Sure. And it's also something, too, that my dad always tells me that I have the medical power of attorney because I'm the only <laughs> I'm the only one who's bitchy enough and mean enough to actually pull the plug. <laughs> That's Becky, too. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> but I mean, you, what what type of life is that for somebody? And then there is a case within the last five to ten years, and I cannot remember her name. She was from California and she moved to either Oregon or wash, I think it was Washington, um, because she had Terminal brain tumor cancer, or something right? like yep. that. I remember. And she wanted to go out on her terms. And in California, they didn't, they wouldn't do the physician assisted suicide. I also, I need to find it. But when I was in high school, I wrote a really good paper on Dr. Kevorkian. <laughs> yeah, you. Funny how you're, uh, you know, when I was 18, I was completely against him. And now that I'm 40, I'm like, I think he was doing wonderful work, but I'm sure somebody out there will be like, what the fuck are you talking about, Tim? But anyway. Oh, yeah. People um, are going to be like, what are you guys talking about? You guys are insane. Um, but no, and I'm pretty, I think it was Washington, and they had just recently legalized physician assisted suicide. And again, it's something she did on, her, she went out on her terms. And her, she had talked with her husband and her family and made sure that they were all, they were all on the same page. They were all on board that, this is what she wants, you know, when it gets to this point, you know, if I can't say my name or what, you know, they, they had an agreed point where that was a time when she was going to go. Sure. And I like this. Each warrior must decide if the time has come to join the exit club rather than die in disgrace. You know, that that's a great, a great way to think about it. And then Cabot. So this, um, but if the warrior can no longer communicate and has no control. 
So I, I don't always, anyway, I got to share a quick story here because <laughs> it, I had a, a, just a rough and tumble guy that used to be my operator in the oil patch. And he survived a 35 foot fall off, onto a cement floor one time when he was younger and beat it. And he was a rough guy. Anyway, a couple of years after he retired, he was only 51. He had a massive stroke. They rushed him to the hospital. He had massive brain damage. He spent the last eight years, five to eight years of his life wearing a hockey helmet, drooling, sitting in a mm -hmm. retirement home. I have no interest in that. No. And I think Cabot here, but if the warrior can no longer communicate, I think we need to make our wishes known. I think that's what you're saying, right, Letty? Yeah, make absolutely. Them ahead of time and maybe put them on paper. Yeah. Get it, get it written down. Get it. You can, you can put that stuff into your will. <laughs> Sure. Um, like if you are very specific about it, you know, I do not want to be kept on that life support. If I were to become a vegetable, I don't want, again, what kind of life is that for that person? You know, and I, and I know there's always people who are, oh, I've been praying for a miracle and I, we're going to have a miracle with this and it's going to work out, but it doesn't, it doesn't always nine times out of 10, it's not going to happen. I'm a math guy. I like to go with the odds, right? <laughs> and I know, I know yeah. it is what it is, but it, it's tough. And I'm, especially if it's your child, you know, and mm. we're, we're, we're dealing with that in our family. We have a, a family member who was diagnosed with cancer, mm -hmm. um, glioblastoma. He has four or five brain grapes up there. And it's funny because we keep getting told, you need to come and say goodbye. You need to come and say goodbye. You need to see him and say goodbye. And like, we, we made our peace with it once we got the diagnosis last year that something's going to happen to him. Sure. It could be tomorrow. It could be next year. We don't know. It's been 13 months now and he's still hanging on. But every time my mother-in-law goes down there, she comes back. She's like, he looks even worse now. He's he's at Thanksgiving. He was all swollen from the steroids, from the chemo and the radiation. But now this time he's like, he's turning into a skeleton and he's turning yellow. And I'm sitting there. I'm like, okay, well, he's clearly not eating. Um, would a feeding tube be good for me? I wouldn't want that, you no. know, and I'm as like, as I'm here in this, like we're sitting back here talking about it, you know? Okay. So if you're turning yellow, that means the kidneys are starting to shut down. The liver starting to shut down. All right. Well, at that point, it's usually, you know, how much time would, could you have left? So we're trying to just guesstimate when would we maybe have a funeral to go to? I get it. It sounds terrible, but I'm a planner too. So I like to know if I can, that I've got something coming up like that, but it's, it's interest. It's so interesting to see how everybody reacts to it. Cause my husband and I, when we've seen him, we've just been like, Hey, how's it going? You know, to chat, like everything's Normal okay. Normal talk. Yes. That's Cause important. it's, it's one of the worst things you can do is treat them like they're on death's doorstep, you know, and it would be different if, if he said, you know, you just, you can treat me like a patient, but I could see the pain in his eyes when, he could hear his mother and his aunts hysterically crying in the next room. And you just hear them whispering his name. What, like, what are you, you're treating him like he's dead already, right. <laughs> you know? And there's this one book that I had read. It's called um, Final Gifts by Maggie Callanan. And this was actually recommended to me by a friend who used to work in hospice. And the book it helps you as the caregiver to understand and respond to the requests of the people who are dying. Okay. And it helps you and them and the dying person prepare emotionally and spiritually for death. Hmm. And that's, it's one of the most powerful books I've ever read. <laughs> and I'm so glad that I did because I've never been with somebody right when they've died. I, this is the last person my grandmother spoke to before she died. And, I laid her down to go to bed and she passed away the next day, but I wish I had read this book <laughs> 15 years ago because it would have helped a lot more. But at the same time, it's not easy being the one who's caring for somebody who is about to pass off the earth, you know? What about, you talked about your, was it your cousin or someone in your family that's dealing with it? The treatment end of things as well. I mean, that's a personal decision, but Absolutely. That, that would go in your death plan as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Absolutely. If you were, so if one of us were to be diagnosed with cancer, 
we would make sure that our death plans were updated. And a lot of it too is you gotta you have to look at the, if it's cancer, you need to look at the type of cancer, what stages is it is it at, what are the treatment options, and what's the quality of life on those treatments. That you know, this one. this family member has a five year old son. Oh yeah. And he's watching his dad deal with seizures. His dad can't get up and take care of him anymore. And I don't want little man or bug to have to deal with that, especially at that young of an age. Yeah. So it, this is the one time where you can really be super duper selfish. Sure. And say, no, I don't want that. And make sure that everybody knows you don't want that. Be out, be up front with your, with your desires and share it and, you know, show and, it to the rooftops if you need and, to. And it sucks because then you have the outside influences. You have the other family members. You have the friends. Oh, well, I was reading about your diagnosis. And did you know that you can do X, Y, or Z? And Try it can prolong your life for whatever. Turmeric well, and That's great, and but do you think I haven't read up on that? Right. So it it's very difficult. And I have a friend who lost her dad a few months ago. And I had warned her. I said... When somebody dies, it brings out the absolute worst in your family and your friends. Yeah, it does. It absolutely does. And sometimes on purpose, sometimes not, right? Yeah. And she's she's now dealing with some stuff and she keeps coming back to me. She's like, I just got this letter about probate. And I looked at it, I was like, I wouldn't sign that thing. <laughs> said you said you want your stepmother to get everything your dad had. And she's like, Oh hell no, he still owes back child support. I said, Go get that money, girl. <laughs> I said, have your mom fill out the paperwork and go get it. <laughs> That's tough, you know, eh? So it it can be ugly. <laughs> How about I, we've been pretty deep and and not dark, but just deep. What about do you ever? I don't know on your end with the Irish funerals and stuff, but do you think that they should be a time to laugh and celebrate as well? Absolutely, absolutely. There's nothing. There's nothing better than to like like I was talking about the eulogies. Yep. There's yeah. nothing better than to have a eulogy that gets people laughing. And one of the worst, one of the worst funerals I went to was for a cousin who committed suicide. He drove into a lake and drowned wow. and his grandfather on his dad's side planned the funeral and all the readings had to do with water. And I'm sitting there, it's just like, oh I'm watching my, my cousin God. who was his mother and my aunt who was his grandmother. And they were just freaking out because they didn't, they didn't have anything to do with the planning. I was like, how could you do that? <laughs> you know? And like they they were singing the song Waters of Life, and I'm like, this is the worst funeral I've ever been to. <laughs> like when was I got it, home, I, I told my purpose? parents, yeah, the his his grandfather because he died in the water. He wanted it to be all water related, but oh. it just it wasn't the right. It was not the right thing because he was. I think he had just turned 21. It was it was a bad thing and. You know, so you got to make sure that your readings, your songs are appropriate. Oh, I never, yeah, I wouldn't but have yeah, thought of that. I mean, I mean, bring, bring the humor, bring the memory, the the happy memories. The we were little man was about nine months old, and we went to a funeral for one of my grandmother's cousins who he was the last one in their age bracket to die, and he was like ninety something. And we walk in, we go to the the wake the day before and everyone's like, oh, who's this? And I said, oh, this is my son. And it was funny because I was named after my grandmother's elder sister. So I hadn't met all of these cousins before because they were slightly distant. And the one looks at me that says, do you know who you were named after? And I was like, no, I have absolutely no idea. It must have been Mickey's aunt, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we all started laughing and it was it. You know, so we started the laughter there. And then the next day we go to the funeral and we're in the church and little man's looking all around and he's blabbering, you know, and like people are starting to cry, but they hear him giggling and doing his nine month old babble. The smile started and the laughter Aww. started and then the bagpipes start. <laughs> little man starts screaming. <laughs> so I have to walk him out. And when the piper leaves the church after walking in, I bring him back in and everyone's like, oh, that was so, someone's never heard bagpipes in a church before, has he? And I said, no, this is, so this is third funeral, but the first one with bagpipes, you know, 
Um, and to me, there's nothing better than bringing your kids. We had a memorial for an uncle last year and little man was three and he was with his four year old cousin and they kept like looking at each other over the, the pews and chit chatting and laughing. And afterwards, everyone was like, we're so glad that you guys had the kids there because there's nothing better than going to a funeral and hearing the little kids because with every death, there's a birth. There's always life. Life goes mm -hmm. on. And when you have the kids there, it continues it. So we get the la we got the laughter at the eulogy, but then we got the laughter at the kids too. It's good. I, you know, like you said, I, I mean, you can cry and laugh at the same time. We, oh, absolutely. We had to carry my grandfather, the six cousins, when he passed, and he was a joker. I mean, every picture you see of him from when we were younger, <laughs> he'd be dressed up in a dress or wearing a stupid hat or you know, just dumb, you know. And so when we were carrying him, the six cousins, of course, we kept pretending to drop his casket. <laughs> and everybody, because that's what he would want. He didn't want anybody to sit around and cry. No. And he, never, he never did that a day in his life. It was always a goofball. And I don't know where I, you know, uh, where, where I got that from, but that's just part of it. You just, why, why not fool around? Yeah. You got, you have to, because if you just focus on the person that died and all you do is you mourn and you're sad and you're depressed, what type of life? Are you living for them? Hmm. You know, you're, you're you die. You die two deaths. You die when your body gives out, and then you die when that last person remembers you. If we're not here, the ones that are left behind, who are sharing the stories—the good, the bad, the ugly, the sad, the funny—who else is going to do it? I've known a few relatives and and friends over the years who who got stuck after a death mm -hmm. and never never really get out of it or yeah or it took you know we're, we're talking 20 years at this point and they're a couple of them are still stuck and, yeah, and the denial and anger phase is really difficult for a lot of them to get past and i don't know what do you think like what do you do how do you i mean i know i can't necessarily help them but what well, if a person's ready where do you go to for help for that do you think i mean there's grief counselors available um that for the, for me, that's one of the, the best options that I've I've seen to to send people to. Go find somebody who deals in grief. Talk to somebody who doesn't even know the person that died. Sometimes it's easier to hmm. share your emotions and your feelings with someone who never met that person. Mm -hmm. you no, know, it could be a family member, it could be a friend, it could be that grief counselor or just a regular old therapist. You know, but the but you you can't force somebody to go through and accept the fact that someone died. Right. They have to be ready and willing. And I've met people too, and it's been 30 years and they still can't get over the fact that so-and-so died. They never, but, it's like they stopped living, right? Yeah. Or you see them and they're acting, you, you see them and they're acting in ways that just are not sustainable. So, Oh. Hoarding is hoarding is one of the biggest problems. I'm a big fan of the show Hoarders. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, so is that a and it's and it's quite thing? interesting to see the number of people on that show who their hoarding started after a sudden loss of a child, a husband, a parent, and they just they lost themselves and they just went into they threw themselves into whatever it is that they're hoarding. So huh part of their their therapy is dealing with the grief and it's coming to accept the loss of that family member and how to get and they they work their way through it some of them do some of them don't that's why hoarders has got so many seasons and episodes <laughs> but <laughs> so you, you you know we talk we're talking about dealing with it and that sort of thing but you you sent me a term or we you know in the notes that i I might have heard of one time before, and I didn't, the whole idea, I knew what a doula was, but, <laughs> you know, when you said death doula, I don't know, have you seen the movie Dr. Sleep, by chance? I have not, it's on my list. Okay, I well, know. I think that's what first came to my mind, anyway, but that's, so what What? What? What the hell is a death doula? And <laughs> yeah, are, are they a big thing yet, or no? They're starting to become more popular. Okay. So... For those who don't know, a regular doula helps people like me, who's about to give birth, <laughs> um, make sure that all of your wishes and everything are taken care of. It's kind of difficult now with all the COVID crap because 
some hospitals you still can't have people come in, but right. they're there to help you make sure that if you're having giving birth at home, that it's comfortable and they they're not a midwife, <laughs> but they do a lot of the stuff that the midwife does. So the doula helps you come into this world. The death doula helps you exit. <laughs> is it the same person doing both or is it typically? It could both? be. Okay. It, it absolutely could be. And if you look back historically, there is always your midwife in the town who would help with the births. And that same woman would usually be the one who was there helping with the deaths, really? cleansing the body, helping the family get them prepared for burial and everything. But the, the thing with the death doula is the death doula will help you prepare. So we're, and it, it, it's the same thing as what I have on my planning spreadsheet. Where do you want to die? How do you want to die? If you're dying at home, what do you want your deathbed to look like? Do you want to be surrounded by flowers? Do you want the specific smell? Do you want to hear ocean waves because maybe you grew up on the beach, but now you're in the mountains, so you can't get to the ocean, you know, so that your death is very peaceful and calm versus being all crazy. And then it, I actually heard about this term probably two or three years ago. I had found this YouTube channel called Ask a Mortician. Okay. I think, yeah. um, Caitlin Doty is the, she's a mortician from LA and she actually, she's one of the founders of the order of the good death. So it's all about normalizing death, death positivity and dying on your terms. Um, okay. She's, she's also about a very natural burial. So shroud in the ground under a tree, none of the formaldehyde injections and all that stuff. Mm hmm um, and she, she actually had an episode where she interviewed a death doula and this woman came and like, she showed you how with, she used Caitlin as the dying person and showed you how she would make you prepared for, for death. Like, okay, well, what would you like on your bed? You know? And she actually goes through the whole rigmarole with Caitlin in this video. And it, that opened my eyes. I said, I didn't know that people did that because hmm. I had thought <laughs> about going back to school to become uh, a mortician. Okay. But then I realized that it would be like a full in-depth year's worth of work and I would be away from little man. So I said, okay, that's not going to happen. But then I found out about death doulas and I was like, I could do that. It's not going to be something I would do till him and bug are older and I can be away for a couple days at a time. But you know, it, how many people die on their own? Right. You know, you, you don't, Right. You, you get people advocating for you when you're being born and for the mother, but who's advocating for you when you die? Especially a lot of the people living in retirement homes whose family yep. just kind of threw them up there and left them, right? Absolutely. I never thought of that. That's incredible. Yeah. So is that something you're looking at doing or you think you'd like it's, to? It's something that I've, I've thought about doing and our friend Amy from Farmer's Kind of Life <laughs> She had actually brought it up to me at some point last year. She's like, so this might sound really weird, but have you ever heard of a death doula? And I was like, oh man, girl, like that, I've been thinking about that. She's like, me too. So we, really? we, oh, we, okay. we bonded over that. But, you know, for her, it was just the, the unreliable hours. You don't, you could be called out at any time and you don't know how long you're going to be gone for sure. because you meet with the person to get everything ready to go. And then, you're kind of just waiting for that call so that you can get over there like for the last couple of days, last couple of hours. And then you, then you're there and yeah. And that's not yeah. a, it's not a process. Obviously you can rush. Right? No. <laughs> yeah. But again, it comes down to, because nobody wants to die alone in, in the book, final gifts. One of the things that they talk about is many times that, the dying person will wait until their family member leaves the room. I've heard that. And I know that's what happened with grandma. My, my uncle had been sitting with her and then he walked out and he walked back in like, cause he went to go get a drink of water, came back and she was dead. Wow. You know, she, she died in her sleep. She's 97 years old. The way she wanted to go, she was at home. So I was like, good for you, grandma. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's usually, they, 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 because they don't want to die in front of their family members. They don't want them to have that memory yeah. be of grandma or mom breathing out her last, you know? So with the death doula, the, the death doula, 
will assist the family in making sure that there's always someone there. But then it's one of those things too, that if you can tell, you can tell that the dying person is holding on just because so-and-so's there. So the, a good death doula <laughs> would be able to suggest, Oh, Tim, you know what? I'll sit here with Becky. Why don't you go, go grab a sandwich or, can you, why don't you go check on the kid? Just let them know how things are going. Sure. And then Becky could breathe her last and yeah, all of that, you know? So it, it takes, it takes the pressure off of the family members. You can see that. That's neat. Yeah. I, I think that sounds like you got yourself a calling there for sure. <laughs> it's definitely, it's definitely something that probably in about, 10 or 15 years I'll really look harder into when I'm able to get away from home <laughs> with the kids being older. So we've, yeah. Um, so what, do, yeah, we'll start wrapping up. I think I mean, we've, this has been great. I, this has been awesome, but what, do you, I, this isn't a question that I was going to, what do you think? What, what is something, what's the one thing either you give people advice on the, the, the topic of death or what do you think is the biggest thing that needs to change around our understanding of death, you know, like, or, or a few things like what's your, what's your big passion? I mean, it sounds like one of them is, is, is non, well, I guess personal choice, but not, not being embalmed and that sort of thing. But do, do you think maybe it's just more open lines of communication or, or what? I, I think, I think we need to bring death back into the home. Okay. You know, it, it needs to be it needs to be a regular part of life. I I went to college and we went to a funeral for a sorority sister's mom, and out of the thirty of us that went, only five of us had ever been to a wake or a funeral before. And, and I was I, like, "How have you made it to be in your late teens and early twenties and have never been to a funeral?" Right. Um, we we need to stop. We need to stop shielding our children from it <laughs> because. If they grow up and they're used to it, they're not going to be scared of it. And we need, so we, we need to normalize it and we need to make it positive. It's not a scary thing. It happens to everyone. And once you accept that, then, then you, then you can start making it positive. That's when you can start having those productive conversations about what I want for my death what do you want for your death? Okay, let's make sure we're on the same page so that it can be a positive experience for everyone. That's awesome. That's, <laughs> man, you, I didn't, I had no idea how much you knew about this topic. <laughs> this so how do, how do people find you, Letty? Um, I have the Liberty All Day blog and podcast. It's a weekly blog. The podcast is once a month-ish. Mm -hmm. What do you blog about? <laughs> Life. Yeah. <laughs> Life. I, I I think I did a blog on death at some point recently. I know I know I've done a couple podcasts on death, a couple blogs on it. Um yes, but it it, it started out as a passion project about three years ago just because it's like I'm staying home with my kid, I need something to do. Sure. So we had just left the, the suburbs for a more rural life and it it's kind of documented how we've we've gone from one way of thinking to the other, trying to lead a li more liberty oriented life. But uh, yeah, so libertyallday.home.blog is the blog. And then there's a link to the podcast. Um, I just started my YouTube channel back up. Good for you. I think I've got, I've got two newer videos on there. Um, everything's also on Odyssey. I have audio and video over on Odyssey. I'm trying to avoid the, the Facebooks, the YouTubes and stuff as much as I can, but I mean, you know, you guys in Fireside Freedom got me back over onto YouTube, so what can I do? What can I do with it, you know? And they can find you on uh, Fireside Freedom as well. Absolutely, they, yep. Which is a lot of fun. And we met in real life, didn't we? That was great. Yes, we did down in Tennessee. That <laughs> yeah, was fun. I enjoyed that. that was a lot. We had a good time. <laughs> and I threw your link. I, I have your blog link in the description uh, okay. for everybody, so make sure you go out and support Letty Lou. And do you, are you still doing your Irish songs? I am, I am. I haven't done one in a couple weeks. I need to I need to get a couple recorded. We've okay. we've just been doing project after project here trying to get well, it's things. It's not like you got anything big on the go. What are you doing, Letty? <laughs> I'm just dating it. I'm making a child, a person. Yeah. I know it's crazy. 
Uh, yeah, no, uh, like I said, we, we got a lot done outside today and tomorrow I think we're going to start doing some painting because this house is all white from when That's we bought great. it last fall and I need some color. <laughs> well, thanks, Letty. This was a lot of fun. This was a lot of fun. Legitimately, you made death a topic we can at least chat about a little bit, hey? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Like I said, everybody needs to be able to talk about death and not just in terms of, I'm so scared to die. You're right, because it's going to happen whether you want to deal with it or not, right? Yep, so we may as well face it ready to go, like a warrior, you know? Perfect. Well, if you want to hang around for a sec in the background, I'll just close up and I'll be right back with you. Absolutely. Cool. Thanks, Letty. Thank you. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. It looked like we had a really good crew in here, a big, big crew in uh, on the YouTube, and there was a bunch in the Telegram as well, and... I, I had no idea. I knew Letty knew a bit, but I had no idea that she was uh, this well versed in the topics of death. But it was a great episode. Um, I, I loved it. It was just. I hope it. I hope it opened your guys' eyes to the whole topic as well, because it's something we don't always talk about, and that's why I picked it because it was something that maybe didn't make me the most comfortable in the world either. But I wanted to deal with it because it's something we all need to talk about. So I just wanted to say thanks to Letty one more time and. Make sure it's the workshop. Most of you know her anyway, but if you're not following her, go by, check out her blog, check out her uh, her podcast and her YouTube channel. And guys, I appreciate it. This has been awesome. Uh, be a couple of episodes, I think, unless something changes before I come back live. My next live should be next Sunday night, but there'll be some pre-recorded stuff for you. So I appreciate you guys dropping into the workshop absolutely every evening and especially in the summer when there's so much good things to be doing. So guys, as always, Stay happy, stay healthy, and have a great week.